Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Ivy Faulkner Gentry. I'm from the University of Minnesota. Um, I revised my title after I submitted my abstract, so I have changed my title to How Long Does It Take to Be Local? The Foreigner Local Threshold um, to draw more attention to the temporal nature of this question. Traditionally, when archaeologists exa have examined the meeting of two groups of people, the focus has been on identifying the resultant material culture in terms of quantifying how much contact or mixture occurred. Increasingly, we have come to realize that culture contact is an incredibly complex set of behaviors that cannot be easily quantified. The exchange of ideas and goods, particularly in situations of prolonged contact, can blur or eliminate distinct cultural boundaries in the archaeological record. In these situations of prolonged interaction, when groups may even intermarry and create new hybridized identities, are distinctions of foreigner and local still relevant? If not, how long does it take to cross the boundary from one identity to another? Identity is multifaceted, so the answers to these questions will likely not be straightforward. However, it is important for archaeologists analyzing these sorts of situations to recognize this complexity. An examination of various cases demonstrates the presence of layered amalgamations, foreign, local, and hybrid identities. How long does it take for this amalgamation to form, and or what does the transition from one type of identity to another look like archaeologically? One of the initial difficulties faced by a discussion of the threshold between foreigners and locals is terminology. In this paper, I will address a few of the relevant terms, indigenous, hybrid, colonialism, and culture contact. Many of the problems associated with these and other related terms, like creolization, derive from their use divorced from their original geographic and cultural context. For example, hybrid was originally used as a biological concept, referring to the usually infertile offspring of two different species, but in anthropology it reflects racial ideology in its early usage, with the hybrid as something impure, and subsequently it has been used to describe multiple types of cultural construction. This paper follows the approach of Carla Antonaccio, who emphasizes the importance of the lived experience in the interpretation of prehistoric material culture. This framework for understanding the significance of objects in culture context situations necessarily includes a consideration of identity formation. In this discussion, I have made the conscious decision to use the term local rather than indigenous. Typical scholarship of culture contact presupposes an association association of antecedent cultures with indigeneity. Indigenous implies a group that originated in that area, whereas many of the groups involved in European prehistory, such as the Scythians or the Celts, migrated into the areas they inhabited when they were encountered by literate cultures like the Greeks and Romans. However, because they had lived in these regions for generations by the time of contact, they were now the locals compared to the foreign Mediterranean settlers and colonizers, and were therefore referred to by them as the native population of the region. So, for example, in this map on the slide, you can see the expansion of different haplogroups into Europe, um, demonstrating that at one point or another, no one was indigenous. Furthermore, there's often an additional assumption of pre-contact cultural purity, which is almost never borne out. On the one hand, it is problematic to define set cultural units, which are typically described using ethnicity, because predefined material culture terminology can cloud complex identities and material practices thereby oversimplifying our understanding of dynamic behaviors. In fact, it is through situations of culture contact when one group identity is juxtaposed or placed in opposition to another that ethnic identities are formed. On the other hand, this assumption denies the existence of early interaction in the form of trade and exchange prior to migration or colonization. For example, as Ross 2012 notes, when looking at the presence of beer bottles in Japanese immigrant sites in the United States, we should also take into account the incorporation of beer into Japanese culture in the homeland prior to the period of the site. For this reason, beer bottles cannot be taken as evidence of Western influence on the site itself, but may perhaps be better contextualized as Western influence on Japanese culture on a larger scale. The term hybridity in contrast has been critiqued quite extensively, with different author authors providing different interpretations. Some authors, like Antonaccio, emphasize the spatiality of hybridity in contact areas, as well as the process of negotiation it requires. To quote her, hybridity is a space of mediation in which the interdependence of colonizer and colonized is acknowledged and considers the cultural forms with which it manifests. The field of Greek colonization thus becomes a middle ground of encounter, one in which accommodation but also mutual incomprehension is a crucible in which mixed or hybrid cultures and societies are formed." End quote. 
In this framework, it is not a unidirectional process, but rather multidirectional. As a result, both indigenous and Greek communities were hybridized, but what was signaled by their respective hybridities was different. This is because hybridity is not simply a mixture of distinct cultural traditions, but a reworking of various elements within those traditions to create something unique in its ambivalent ethnicity. In discussing what constitutes hybrid material culture, Deegan suggests that it involves the amalgamation of forms, practices, genes, expressions, and symbols from distinct traditions into new traditions or expressions. However, however Deegan also recognizes that this working definition is somewhat simplified. For example, she questions whether any new material form or material change that is generated or incorporated in response to culture contact be considered hybrid? Can material hybridity be expressed at the scale of an assemblage? For example, one containing multiple, but essentially unaltered traditional objects from several cultural sources, as in most historic periods involved in exchange. For example, here think of acquiring tourist items in different regions and then bringing them home to create your own hybrid assemblage. And indeed, as Lieben 2013 reminds us, ultimately all cultures are mixtures. However, using the concept of hybridity provides us with a way to discuss the negotiation of these mixtures and the continued dialogue between actors and culture contact over time. The creation of new forms of either identity or material culture can occur as a result of a variety of different types of interaction. However, much of the scholarship on hybrid artifacts has focused on colonial contexts. The term colonialism has already been critiqued by a number of scholars in the past, so I will not spend much time reviewing the discussion here. Instead, I will begin with a working definition provided by Silliman. Colonialism is generally defined as a process by which a city or nation state exerts control over people termed indigenous and ter territories outside of its geographical boundaries. Archaeology on colonialism in the Roman period has shifted towards recognition of more complex types of interaction. Moving beyond paradigms of passive assimilation of Roman culture or Romanization, post-colonial theory and Roman scholarship has tended to focus more on the complex nature of colonial identities emphasizing their locally variable hybridity. The formation of these new hybrid identities, or the process of becoming Roman, does not imply flooding of Europe with the Romans, but the selective acceptance of Roman identity and cultural templates, this time accom accompanied with the ideology of newly created elite discourse on the Roman Empire, and an Augustan reinvention of Romanists, open to provincials willing to assume and negotiate identity in local contexts, creating hybrid provincial Roman identities. This is evidenced by examination of inscriptions on the Roman frontiers, which demonstrates multiple layers of identity. As Collins 2008 points out, a Roman soldier living in the frontier zone of northern England might occupy 18 roles simultaneously. Demonstrated here on an inscription, uh, someone could be a Roman citizen, a man of a certain family, of senatorial rank and income, this man is someone's son, perhaps sibling and nephew or cousin. Additionally, he's likely to be married and have children of his own not to mention servants and slaves. Each of these familiar relationships informs the man's sense of identity. Further input comes from his education and previous job postings. As a legionary legate, he commands the legion, acts as a judge, serves as a patron for junior officers, commands the resources of the legion in terms of labor and supplies, and yet he himself is a subordinate of the provincial governor and emperor. Culture contact is sometimes used interchangeably with colonization in research on the interaction of different groups of people in the past. In contrast to colonialism, Silliman defines culture contact as a general term used by archaeologists to refer to groups of people coming into or staying in contact for days, years, decades, centuries, or even millennia. In its broadest usage, this contact can range from amicable to hostile, extensive to minor, long-term to short duration, or ancient to recent and it may include a variety of elements such as exchange, integration, slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and diaspora. But in many situations, culture contact may be too vague to offer much value. For example, since cultures do not exist in a vacuum, all cultures are constantly in contact with others to some extent. Therefore, as Chris Cosden points out, what differentiates colonialism from other aspects of contact are issues of power. Deegan also suggests that hybridization is a more useful term compared to colonization because hybridization can result from a variety of different types of contact like migration, trade, political alliance, or intermarriage patterns, 
without the same kinds of power asymmetry inherent in colonization. This power differential means that while all cases of colonization are a form of culture contact, not all cases of culture contact should be considered colonization. One example of hybridization comes from the site of Olbia on the northern Black Sea coast. Olbian burials in the 6th to 5th century BC demonstrate a very diverse, multifaceted, and cross-cultural attitude to burial customs, with elements of both Greek and Scythian cultural affiliations. Here is shown a bronze mirror with an Orphic inscription um, in Greek that demonstrates this hybridity. This mirror's Greek inscription um, demonstrates one cultural aspect, but it's manufactured in a style known as Scythian type. And while mirrors were buried in both Greek and Scythian traditions, their association with Orphic rituals and the presence of Orphic tablets at the site, um, as well as other sites in high in, with high frequencies of mirrors, suggests that this particular artifact had special significance. Because of the complex burial assemblages at Olbia, Patterson argues that the people of Olbia were fully aware of the signal values, Greek versus Scythian, and potentials of the various multicultural components. Here, as in other regions of Greek migration, the emphasis appears to be firmly on local and regional strategies over any kind of overarching identity, such as Greek. In addition, hybridization in southeastern Europe in the 4th to 3rd centuries BC in some ways reflects the earlier expansion of Greek and Greek material culture in the 7th to 5th centuries. The wider acceptance of Latin in temperate Europe is in in a limited way, comparable to the dispersion of Greek cultural templates from the 7th century. That did not imply a large-scale migration from Greece or the Greek conquest of the Mediterranean, but rather the continuous expansion of cultural forms that we recognize as Greek. Their selective acceptance and hybridization with the existing indigenous cultural forms through expanded networks of contact, interchange, and settlement, either individual or through colonization of certain points. While the earlier Greek expansion is not proper colonialism, according to the definition explored above, it does open the door to the transition to becoming local. As Kia points out in a discussion of agrarian clientelism in modern West, After West Africa, once given access to the land, they're able to lay some claim to the land and thereby transform themselves from migrants to local citizens. This prolonged network of interactions, exchange, and reinvention demonstrates that hybridity does not occur at a fixed point in time but over a wider temporal range. Similarly, Hellenistic Babylon provides a case of interaction that is not properly colonialism, but does result in the production of hybrid material culture. Following the establishment of the Seleucid Empire in the third century BC, many Babylonian cities were cohabitated by both Greeks and Babylonians. This is evident in the female terracotta figurines of the period, which were one of the largest categories of personal objects in the region. While both Greeks and Babylonians already possessed traditions related to the use of terracotta figurines as personal objects in religious practice prior to the Hellenistic period, the resultant forms were a unique blend of the two styles. Using a social network model to explore this interaction, Langan Hooper in 2007 asserts that non-cultural based social alliances provide a medium for influence and exchange. In other words, diverse social groups comprised of Greeks and Babylonians created new subgroups of society united through other aspects of their identity. And the hybrid forms of Hellenistic Babylonian figurines is evidence of this mixture. This, this example aligns closely with Lieb's, Liebman's well-known discussion of Mickey Mouse kachinas among the Hopi tribes of North America. More traditional kachinas, which are carved wooden statues of masked dancers, bear mostly animal in imagery such as bears or eagles. However, in the 1950s, tourists began to also come across kachinas featuring the distinctive features of Mickey Mouse. However, importantly, these objects were not just created to cater to the tourists, but they also had significance for the Hopi people as well, recalling traditions, uh, traditional legends related to a mouse character named Tucson Homichi. Therefore, these hybrid objects combined recognizably disparate cultural traditions in order to create what has also been called a double object, simultaneously projecting messages within and across both cultures. So in both Hellenistic Babylon and in recent Hopi culture, personal objects in the form of figurines demonstrate both ritual and cross-cultural significance through the manifestation of hybridity. Some insights into the various manifestations of culture contact can be provided by trans, uh, concepts 
like migration, transnationalism, and diaspora. And I'll see, perhaps I can click on this link here while I'm speaking. If not, we'll go on without it. Like hybridity, transnationalism or bicul biculturalism emphasizes the dual identity of people whose lives cross multiple, I don't know, let me this up here for just a moment. Uh, emphasizes the dual identity of people whose lives cross multiple cultural boundaries and incorporate aspects of each of them. Unfortunately, while this framework directs attention to the maintenance and negotiation of simultaneous physical and psychological relationships between home and host countries, it still uses political units, the nation state, as a basis for discussion. In a similar fashion, diaspora explores the process by which communities of people dispersed from a common homeland form and maintain collective identities rooted in ties to that homeland. And while in some ways diaspora allows archaeologists to circumvent the highly descriptive association of ethnicity while still allowing a discussion of community and identity that cross cut spatial lines, it also falls prey to issues with using cohesive ethnic identities as the basic unit of analysis. Again, diaspora presupposes the nation state. And as Gabaccia asked in her 1999 essay on modern Italian immigration, can one speak of an Italian diaspora before there was an Italian nation? This becomes increasingly problematic when attempting to project these paradigms on the study of immigration into the past. Not only do many of these cases predate modern nations, but they may also involve prehistoric people whose socio-political organization is unclear. Consideration of culture contact is predicated upon a spatial aspect, the movement of people across a landscape. However, the nature and extent of the mobility and prehistory is still greatly debated. While problems of the association of spatial association with nation states and research on immigration or migration have been addressed, concerns about the temporal assumptions behind migration and identity have not been well discussed. Back to my PowerPoint here momentarily. For instance, Deegan notes that colonial ware in Southern America became a traditional ceramic. Thus, the tr transition from hybridity to traditional is another rich potential focus of study, one that may successfully track the transition from one identity to another. Antonaccio also notes that a hybrid may become so completely naturalized that it seems ancient and native. Indeed, a hybrid may become the default and the process is endless. This follows as a material expression of Claussen's framework of integration by which migrants become part of their new society on various levels and in various spheres, and perhaps even transform the society in the process. Finally, following Glick Schiller, I wish to draw attention to the possibility of simultaneous integrations of local, national, and global identities and cultures. Indigenization is one way the foreign to local transition has been discussed in anthropology. This is exciting. I'm not sure where this is coming from. We at Matt. Are committed Must be to there. science, technology, and innovation. Open a window. In 2011, we rolled out the annual Biopharma Innovation Cup for young talent, <laughs> where the brightest students the from YouTube all right? over the world come together in Darmstadt there we go. to develop new ideas covering. Un Thank you. Slightly less exciting in contrast now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, apparently I do. Um, so indigenization is subtly different from the idea of hybridization, which implies a cultural mixture. Instead, indigenization focuses on shifting or ambiguous cultural identities among objects or material practices that are ostensibly identical. To put this another way, indigenization refers to the appropriation of foreign artifacts into local culture, but rather than viewing this as a passive acceptance or emulation, this practice emphasizes the conscious choice and agency of the local peoples. Um, one field of study that is particularly apropos for this type of analysis is foodways. The foods of one culture have been incorporated into another and indigenized to the point that they are no longer considered foreign in a variety of contexts. So for example, I give here Japanese whiskey, um, which we can usually associate as Scottish or Irish, um, but in fact they have award-winning whiskey now selling at about $6,500 a bottle. 
Another example of indigenization of food is the incorporation of Mediterranean wine by locals in the area near Massalia following the Greek colonization or migration and into the Roman period. Wine was appropriated and adapted to local feasting practices rather than being part of an adoption of the Greek social drinking ritual, the symposium. The use of this wine continued alongside local drinks for centuries, apparently without the acquisition of other Mediterranean material culture to any great extent. Furthermore, there does not seem to have been much attempt by locals to produce their own wine. Rather, with the coming of the Romans, importation increased exponentially. However, quoting Dietler 2007, despite a massive increase in the importation of Roman wine into Gaul, contemporary Greco-Roman texts confirm the continued consumption of native drinks, beer and mead, in the region alongside wine. In addition, excavation of domestic structures shows no evident transformation of culinary patterns toward Roman practices. As in previous centuries, there was still a highly selective appropriation and an indig indigenization of a limited number of exotic ingredients." End quote. It was not until the Augustan period and the implementation of new forms of control that the other aspects of material culture began to shift towards the creation of new hybridized identities in the Roman provinces. Finally, I would like to introduce some insights from Neo Cosmos's article on apartheid South Africa. In this case, black South Africans are considered foreign natives, local to the land but not part of the community. In contrast, Neo Cosmos refers to black South Africans in post apartheid South Africa as native foreigners when they conform to stereotypes of legal foreigners. While there were clearly racial prejudice, prejudices influencing this terminology in South Africa, these terms also highlight the sort of ambiguous identity that settlers or even their descendants experience. Sovius 2009 uses a nearly identical terminology, indigenous foreigners, to describe diasporic Greek perspectives on their homeland. However, over time, or perhaps generations, the emphasis may shift from the foreign to the indigenous. To give a personal example, I have lived in Minnesota for the last nine years, and I feel at home there, but I do not consider myself a Minnesotan. I therefore might categorize myself as a native foreigner, or to use my preferred terminology, a local foreigner. I live locally, but I'm orig originally from somewhere else, and I emphasize that identity. Ancient Greeks in areas outside of Greece, like Mediterranean France or the shores of the Black Sea, might have similarly categorized themselves as a combination of foreign and local. This idea of the local foreigner or the foreign local demonstrates the ambiguity in the foreigner local temporal threshold. While an individual might transition from foreigner to local, uh, they might never, or from foreigner to local foreigner, they might never transition to local. This could be due to the social exclusion within that cultural context, or it could reflect a conscious choice to maintain a bicultural identity. To conclude, the question of how long it takes to be local has no easy answers. This paper has instead served to raise awareness of the various attempts anthropologists and archaeologists have made to discuss this issue and propose that we continue to nuance our examination. T context and prehistory increase the difficulties in examining complex changes over time. However, the temporal transitions may have been just as meaningful as the spatial ones. To put it another way, it is not just where you live and where you are from that are significant, but how long have you lived there? Thank you.